I got to tell you about this awesome week I had. We have three children, which you, uh, most of you know, and the youngest one of the three is three years old, nine, six, and three. And the three-year-old, I've shared many stories about him, and I love him to death, and he's a sweet kid, but, but you can put him in any room, and it does not matter how valuable the items in the room are. He can literally destroy it within less than 60 seconds. He's like the little uh, Tasmanian devil. You remember Looney Tunes? That's literally what Jet is like. He's like the Tasmanian devil. He's like... <laughs> Whatever room he goes into, man. And like, he'll go in our basement. That's where, you know, when we're tired, go down to the basement. So he'll take the stuff on the shelves that he can somehow reach. We've had to remove everything from any shelf because he takes it and he just throws it all over the floor. It literally takes him less than 60 seconds. The worst is when he gets into the Legos. Parents, come on now. Uh, some of you babysitters out there, when the Legos are all over the floor and the lights are off, dude, it's like Army Commando style trying to walk through that war zone because you do not want to step on the Lego. Don't call me a wimp. It is painful. You have no idea the depths of that pain. But that's how Jet is. And this week... Uh, he got to finally, after months of bringing it up, get to, he got to go to grandma and grandpa's for two and a half days. Yeah, come on now. Now, grandparents, I know what you're saying. Yay, grandma and grandpa. No, yay, mom and dad. Because we had two and a half days, one of the days of which on Friday I had off, had the entire day off. The two older kids are both in school, and the younger one is with grandma and grandpa. Lisa and I looked at each other and we're like, what do we do? I don't know. Whatever we want. We literally can do whatever we want. It was amazing. I've been sharing all that weekend and I realized that some of you have been going naughty places with that. I was not thinking that all weekend long. Well, we didn't think about it. Let's go to lunch. So we went to lunch together. It was amazing. It was, it was awesome. At the end of the day, we had to go pick up my uh, son at Denny's. He's been at Grandma and Grandpa's the whole time, and, you know, we were texting Grandma and Grandpa, could you maybe just, we might be seven or eight days late. Could you just <laughs> hold on to him for a little bit? And, uh, you know, we get there to Denny's because we're classy like that, and he got, I saw him waking up from the nap, and my messy little three-year-old child, I was just so thankful that we got to be back with him because I don't care how messy he is and how much simpler and easy my life is when he is not around when he's gone we miss him desperately and I believe the passage that we're going to look at today as we study the last supper and Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane that when we lose connection with our heavenly father and we draw away, we haven't been sitting at the feet of Jesus as we have been studying, inviting people to sit with Jesus. This weekend, I want to personalize it to each of us, whether we're new to Christianity or been a Christian for 90 years, what does it look like for you to prioritize sitting at the feet of Jesus? And there is a reason that we often don't do it, and that's what I'm going to describe later in this message. But what I'd like to say is, I don't care how messy your life is, how disobedient you have been as a child of God, if you're like a little messy three-year-old in the faith, he loves you, and when you are gone and aren't connecting with him, he misses you. And he missed the disciples in this passage. You ready to study God's word together, church? Come on now, it says this in verse uh, 26 of Matthew 26. This is like the night before Jesus is going to be betrayed. They're having the, the, the Lord's Supper as we know it today. We remember communion as we share the bread and the, and the, the juice together. We remember the covenant that Jesus uh, fulfills here in this passage. But at that time, they were actually thought of it as celebrating the Passover meal. And we're going to do a little history lesson in the front end here, a little Bible teaching, because you are intelligent human beings, and I want to share this so that you can understand it. And it says that while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat this, is my body. That's kind of strange. Then verse 27, then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What? <laughs> like, you've been Christian too long if you read that and you don't go, what? 
Like, I just want you to picture you were at a social gathering with your closest friends, and you're like, this is my blood shed for you for forgiveness of sins. That's a creepy thing to say, isn't it? But he is redefining something they have known for over 1,500 years. See, the little history lesson with the Jewish community, the ancient Israelites, they actually were enslaved for 430 years. 430 years to the Egyptians. And Pharaoh won't let them leave, and so God speaks to Moses, played by Charlton Heston, and he hears, you know, Moses, let my people go. And so he goes to, to Pharaoh. He tells him, let, let God's people go. He doesn't do it. You know the story. And so God brings the ten plagues. And then they still don't listen. And so the last plague is the worst one. And then they finally are free to go. And God parts the Red Sea. They cross over it 40 years in the wilderness. And they finally get the promised land and all the story of the Old Testament. A little history lesson there. But we forget that last and greatest and most horrific plague the one God didn't want to have occur was the only thing that ended up allowing Pharaoh to finally see it and let his people go. And it was that the firstborn child of every home would die. However, God's spirit would pass over any home that had what above it? Lamb's blood. Because in the, the Jewish faith, the way that they worship God is that this animal would get what I deserve so that I could atone or cover up for a wrongdoing in my life. All the way back since Adam and Eve, humanity has rebelled against God. We are imperfect in nature. And so because of this sacrifice, they could draw near to God. And so every year the Jewish community would have this festival where they would remember the Passover when God's Spirit had passed over the homes that had lamb's blood over it, saved their family, freed them from 430 years of slavery, and finally heard their cries. They passed it down for generations, and now 14 to 1,500 years later, Jesus is there celebrating that Passover meal on the last and greatest day of a festival called the Unleavened Bread Festival. And on the Passover meal, you shared unleavened bread because the Jewish community, the ancient Israelites, didn't have time for the bread to rise. They had to leave their homes so quickly to flee Egypt. And so they remember how God had saved them and provided them and all that he had done. And they would worship it before it. And on that last day, night, they would have this meal together. And the next day would be the Passover day when the Passover lamb would be slain. Now, I've shared this before, and I mentioned this at the last service. But the Passover lamb would be slain. Anybody know what time in the afternoon it would be slain? Three o'clock in the afternoon. Three o'clock in the afternoon, the high priest would come out and say, Tetelestai, it's paid in full. The sins of the Jewish community are paid for one year. If you ever notice in John chapter 19, what time Jesus gives his life up on the cross? Three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, what's the last words that he yells? To tell us die. It's paid in full. The sins of humanity aren't just paid for one year, but for all eternity. So you wouldn't have to doubt that. That's the theological significance of what he's sharing with the disciples in their last meal together. He's saying, look, I, my body is going to be broken. My blood is going to be shed so that anybody forever eternally can draw near to God. Because of his crucifixion, anybody can be made right with the perfect God. You can receive the mercy and grace and forgiveness. It doesn't matter how messy your life is. He still misses you and he wants you to come home. And then because he rose from the grave, anybody here or attending online, if you receive God's grace and forgiveness, you do this beautiful thing, repent of your wrongdoing, that you can actually live eternally with God in heaven. But see, we miss out on one additional piece. It's not just that we'll live with God forever. I mean, that is definitely a huge part of the good news of Jesus. But it's also that you and I, any of us here today, we no longer need a high priest to communicate with God. You and I can talk to God, commune with him through prayer, through scripture, through focusing on him in our lives on a daily basis. When we take and we remember his body was broken, his blood was shed, we call it communion because we can commune with him and with each other as followers of Jesus. And so anybody is welcome to participate in this at the end of the service. We just ask that you have a relationship with Christ. Because too often, we know about God, we know about church, but we don't understand the relationship. Did you read verse 29 yet? This is what I find interesting. See, I had to go to seminary, and I know all the theological significance of the Seder meal and the redefining it as... Uh, what we share communion today and remembering 1,500 years of history of celebrating the Passover. 
But verse 29 says, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's house. Isn't that an interesting thing to say right after that? He's essentially saying, guys, like you, you don't get it. Like, I'm, I'm going to do this. This is my body broken, my blood shed, so anybody can draw near. But I won't get to do this with you again until we're in heaven. It's almost as like, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss this. I'm going to miss this time together. You're familiar with the Lord's Supper a little bit, right? You've seen the painting by Da Vinci, where all the guys are sitting on one side of the table. <laughs> kind of an awkward conversation. Obviously, that's not necessarily true, but they were most likely sitting on the floor together sharing this meal. And he's like, guys, I'm going to miss this. What Jesus does next was not easy, and I believe is a lesson to us as we talk about sitting at the feet of Jesus. I want you to hear, if you forget everything else, when we don't connect with him, we don't spend time with him, we don't sit at his feet, he misses us. He misses us. He longs for his friends, those disciples, and he longs for us today. And that's what I want to show you. Will you pray with me? God, we love you. We worship you. We give you this time. More importantly, God, take my words away. Bring only what you want to share. We acknowledge the presence of your Holy Spirit with us. Speak to us. We love you, God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite now, did I already invite Mark Telementis at this service? Sometimes I can't remember it all. In a moment, the ushers are going to come through with a clipboard. It's going to be passed down the aisle uh, tonight, 6 o'clock. It's not just that God misses you. If you're not here at 6 o'clock tonight, we are going to miss you. We are having our last and final Compassion Dinner tonight as we start four new churches in four different directions. And I just got to share this good news with you as we've begun to prepare teams, sending hundreds of people in four different directions while keeping this church here as the keystone, literally on Keystone Avenue, also the keystone for the other locations. Uh, we are gonna be releasing those churches over the next several years. Last weekend, we had our first person come to Christ because of it. And over in Fishers, there were 300 people uh, worshiping together. It was uh, incredible, and uh, a worship on the water there at Wolfie's, and we had uh, a person, a woman who drove all the way from Westfield, give her life to Christ there. And here's the coolest part. While I did do the welcome, and I immediately got in my car, drove over here to preach, not only was I not there for the service, Eric Maitland wasn't there, our team wasn't there, and yet God worked and somebody came to Christ. And see, that's the vision. That God could do immeasurably more if we just allowed him to act. You know, we were singing that Lion and the Lamb song. I didn't say this at the other services. We started the year, our word for the year was to unleash the lion. To allow God to fully work. That this was the year we were just going to dream big and allow him to do immeasurably more in our life. That's what the Compassion Dinners are about. You are going to get to hear the heart of Mercy Road Church. I really, really want to encourage you. And yes, financially, we're asking for you to participate, but, and we want 100% participation, and it's not about equal giving, but about equal sacrifice. But more than that, I want you to hear the testimonies tonight, because that is why we're doing what we're doing. Six o'clock right here. It's the largest dinner of the three. In fact, I think it's bigger than the other two combined. We're adding a bunch of extra chairs to make room so you can show up at six o'clock, child care provided, free meal, or sign the registration as it comes by. But I want to share with you, I don't know if I've seen this over the course of the dinners, that we're all really busy, aren't we? Just something about us and the fall and American culture, especially in suburban North Indianapolis, we're just really busy. Not just to do with dinners, but when it comes to sitting at the feet of Jesus, I don't know about you, but sometimes, man, I just feel too busy to do that. I've got very important things to watch on Netflix. Right? Like, isn't that your life a little bit? And I found myself going downtown to a concert uh, this last week and like just trying to hurry because we wanted to get there early and there was traffic and then construction. And I found myself like just, you know, like wanting to cut people off in their lanes. It's okay. I prayed about it ahead of time. <laughs> no, like I just in such a rush. You remember that movie Shawshank Redemption when the guys get out of prison and they're like, everybody got in such a big hurry. Like, I feel like I, and I, I can't speak this always into your life, but this message today is really me sharing what God has been teaching me over the last few weeks. That we get so busy 
and distracted. And some of us are even good Christians doing and accomplishing and achieving things for God and his kingdom. But if we don't start first with just being with him, sitting at his feet as we are discussing, we are going to miss out on the power to actually change this world. We get so busy and distracted with so many things. What would it look like to just sit with him for some time? Now, there's a reason we don't sit with him and spend time with him, isn't there? And that's what I want to talk about. My wife, Lisa, told me this is kind of a negative Nancy uh, um, or Debbie Downer message. I just want to tell you that um, sometimes we just need a little challenge. And uh, I'm speaking to myself this weekend. I needed a little challenge. And the main idea is this. Uh, I want to share with you three points why we don't why we don't sit with Jesus. This might as well be why I don't sit with Jesus. And this is the conviction I was feeling. Point number one, if you're taking notes, says this, waiting on God can feel lonely. Why don't I sit at the feet of Jesus? Well, waiting on God can feel lonely sometimes. And I got things I need him to do. Prayers I need answered. Look what happens here in this passage. See, right after the Last Supper, he says, guys, I'm uh, this is my body and this is my blood, and I'm going to miss this time together. I won't get to share it again until heaven. He calls just three of them to join him. As he goes, the night before he's going to be betrayed, he spends all night praying. I don't know about you, but if I was in a room with my uh, best buddies and the environment they were in, I'd have hung out there and had a party on my last night on earth. But this is what Jesus did because he knew it. He knew he would need this in order to face what he was about ready to face. Verse 36 then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, this was a place just outside Jerusalem at the foot of the Mount of Olives, most likely an olive orchard. That he's going there in the middle of the night to just pray. It's not the place people go at night. And he's trying to get away from everything. And he said to them, to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Underline or circle, sit here. Sit here while I go over and play. We're talking about sitting with Jesus. I want you to notice what he asked them to do. What did he ask them to do? Sit down. That was it. He didn't say, hey, I need you to keep watch. Would you do some surveillance activities while I'm out here praying? He didn't say, hey, I need you to uh, go start um, a new ministry while I'm here praying. He just wanted him to sit with him, to spend time there with him as he was praying because he misses them when they're not around. Look what happens here. Verse 37, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John is who that is, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Keep watch with me. By the way, Donald Hagner, a, a biblical scholar that specializes in studying Matthew, he says that this is most likely a reference to the way that God watched over or was vigil over the Israelites during the Passover night. And he's saying, you know how I am always watching over you and there for you in your time of need? I want you to be here with me. Connect with me because I miss you when you're gone. And of course, the disciples, like all human beings, they, they fail. Verse 39, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Remember, he had to find the cup. It was his blood that was going to be shed. He's like, I, I don't want to bleed. Can you take this cup from me? I don't want to endure this. And look what it says after that. This might be the most significant part of the whole passage. He says, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? I'm there for you all the time. Why do you turn your back on me? Why do you run away? Man, I am watching over you, and I know when your family is going through an illness, you're going to turn to me. But when it's between me and Netflix, Netflix always wins. Right? By the way, I'm using Netflix, but there could be a much... Uh, more difficult issue in your life. Your addiction always wins. Your struggles in your relationships always win. Your struggles in your financial decisions always win. See, verse 40, uh, excuse me, verse 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak sometimes, isn't it? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Could you put that verse up there one more time? I just want to make sure we, we get it up. Oh, they give me a sign they don't have it. Verse 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I find that sometimes in my life, man, 
what I desire to do is not what I end up doing. Does that happen to you? You know who that also happened to? The Apostle Paul. What he desired to do was not always what he did. And he writes about that in the New Testament. And so he tells the disciples, I know you want to be with me, but you can't even stay awake. And man, I see that as a, a challenge to me. The reason I don't sit with him, because waiting on God sometimes can feel lonely, and I can go like, okay, why am I doing this? Where are you, God? And I'm praying, and you're not showing up. You ever done that? I want to tell you, when we first moved here to start the church, do you know what happened the year and a half before God called us to move from Southern California to come here? We had been saving up for years to purchase a home. We just had our first son, and, you know, we had to live the American dream. You can't be American if you don't buy a home. So I thought, well, that's what we got to do. That's the next step for the family. And we have been praying, and then the economy tanked. Ministry was going really well, so our pay didn't change at all, but the cost of homes went way down in Southern California, like a million percent. It was awesome. We put 40-some offers on homes, and not a single one was accepted. Over a year and a half, we were multiple times the highest bid, sometimes by as much as $15,000, and we never got a home. I was so frustrated with God. God, where are you? What are you doing? I need you now. I feel very alone here. I think you're, you want us to minister here, and like we want to settle down here. Why aren't you going to provide for our family? My, my wife and I and our first child, we were living in a back house, which was essentially a garage that had been converted. And uh, we had saved up, and we had money to do this. We were going, God, why don't you make this happen? Well, he didn't tell me. But the only way we were able to move here from Southern California, we've been working at that mega church was because we had saved up all these resources that we thought was for a house in Southern California that actually was going to help us be able to take a lower pay so we could start a church. And we moved here, and God said, these three friends from high school were going to help me start a church. It seemed insane, and all of it happened. All of it happened. I know it can feel lonely waiting on God sometimes to respond. It had to feel super lonely for Jesus there as he's sitting there praying all by himself and the disciples won't even stay awake for him. And yet he's going to say, let your will be done. I want to tell you, if you have been waiting for that husband or that wife, and some of you, you have been praying for decades or years. Some of you, you've been praying for like hours. You're like, God, where are you? I need that man. I'm not full and fulfilled without a man or a woman. Or, uh. By the way, I'm not making light of what you're going through, but sometimes it's the waiting process where God grows our faith the most, preparing us for what is coming next, and we don't even see it or know it. We always want to ask the why questions, and I think sometimes we don't always get the answer to the why questions, but we get the answer to the what. And what God needs from us from any season of life is just faithfulness. You go, why, God, I want this promotion at work, and you're praying for it, and it just it doesn't happen the way you want. God, I want my husband to finally figure out he's wrong, and I just want him to be wrong. And it, it, like he says, you know, just keep spending time with me praying, and eventually I can change lives. The reason some of us don't sit at the feet of Jesus is it can be lonely doing that. Jesus experiences that. The truth is waiting isn't bad. Waiting isn't bad if you're listening for God in your life. If you're listening for God, I'd encourage you though, are you listening for God? Because if you're listening for God, point number two, if you're taking notes of why we don't sit with Jesus, choosing God's will can be difficult. It can be difficult sometimes, right? Like that's the reason we don't do it. Look what happens in this passage. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup, again, remember what the cup is, to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy, so he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time. He's prayed three times, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. By the way, you remember who the betrayer was? Judas, one of his closest friends. I don't know about you, but your closest three disciples can't even stay awake when you're about to face death. And then one of your closest 12 friends betrayed you and turned you over to be crucified. You will be crucified and, and die and suffocate in front of your friends and family. I don't know about you, but that's a bad day. Can we disagree on that? 
I don't know what's going on in your life, but that's a bad day. And he is praying to his father, take this cup, God, I don't want to go through this. Father, please, please don't. But sometimes choosing let your will be done isn't easy. It's difficult. Number two, why we don't sit with Jesus, choosing God's will can feel difficult. Do you ever, in your life, do you ever know God's will but choose your own? Come on, of course you do. Like, you know God's will in your life of how to behave in certain situations, and yet you choose your own. I remember when I first became a Christian, uh, almost two decades ago, I was living in a fraternity house, and I went to a fraternity party where there there were uh, drinks that fraternity people partake in uh, happening all around me. And for the first time, I was underage, and I was a Christian. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go in there and live my faith out. And I went to that party all night long and had just as much fun as everybody else there. No, that's not true. That's not true. When people tell you that, they are totally lying. They are totally lying. It was not nearly as much fun. It was not as much fun at all. It felt lonely. It felt difficult. And that's what it takes sometimes is choosing God's will in your life isn't always easy. And yet it's more meaningful. And I walked away from those experiences going, now I know my purpose on this planet. And I don't have to have those feelings and those doubts and those fears and those things I would go to bed at night thinking about. I could know why I'm here on this planet. I can know where I'm going to spend eternity. And I'm living for more than just my selfish desires. See, choosing God's will can be difficult in your life. Or do you allow God to help choose your will when it comes to your dating life? Right? We, we know God's will on some of this stuff because it's in Scripture. Like, do we base our decisions, like, do we allow, do we choose his will in scripture when it comes to our dating life, in our marriage, in our sexual life, our view of sexuality, and when it comes to our financial uh, decisions, when it comes to all the pivotal things in life, our addictive habits, dealing with children who have addictive habits, do we choose and prioritize God's will in those instances? Because that's not easy. It's difficult to do, and it's why most people don't sit at the feet of Jesus, because they're like, I, this is too hard. I'd just rather go do my own thing. We, we use this uh, phrase here, it's a Greek word, kairos, it means time, but it's like where God breaks through times, it's God times, God moments in our lives where he speaks to you. And it happens when, anytime you read scripture, that's God-inspired word in your life, you can know it and trust it, but it also can happen just as you're praying, maybe you're even listening to a, a worship song on the radio and God speaks to you in that moment. You need to go check it with scripture and you need to go seek out Christian uh, wise counsel on major decisions and make sure all those things are lining up. Absolutely. It's not like, you know, you had bad pizza last night and in 30 seconds you make a crazy life decision. But hearing from God is real. That's what the sacrifice and what communion is all about. That you and I can communicate. And when we don't, he misses us. But we choose not to because it feels lonely sometimes and it can feel difficult many times. And yet it can be the most moving thing that we could possibly do in our life. I want to tell you a couple of things. First of all, for us as a church, I feel like this is critical in our season of church. Tonight, again, we'll be sharing how we're going to one day have five churches, this church, and then four new ones, and we're sending hundreds of people out in four different directions because we believe that it's not about a person or individual or professional Christians that are sleeping giants of the faith that sit in the seat every weekend and God's going to awaken you and he's going to use you and he's going to send you out like he's been doing for 2,000 years and he's going to use you to change a life. You know, I know that uh, Eric and Aaron are amazing worship leaders. You know why they're amazing worship leaders? Because they were gifted, yes, but then they've done it thousands of times. You know why Pastor Darren is such a great communicator And why I've gotten better at this whole thing, because yeah, we're gifted, absolutely, but it's also that we have done it thousands of times. And there are other people here that God is awakening you in your spiritual gifts, and when you use those hundreds and then thousands of times, he is going to use you to change the course of human history in the state of Indiana. Do you believe that? Because that's what we're doing. And I just want to apply, if if we're doing all of this stuff and changing the course of human history, all that big statements that we believe, unleashing the lion fully in our lives, doing immeasurably more in our lifetime because he is real. I can tell you this, it will just be a bunch of doing and trying and achieving and God won't be there if it doesn't begin with us being with him and sitting with him first. We can go out and do all that stuff and God isn't in those churches. We're not hitting our knees in the morning and hitting our knees in the evening. 
And I want to encourage you, if you are here today, and I want to personalize this now, if you are making major, pivotal life decisions, right? If, if you're deciding, like, what you want to do for the next 20 years of your life or who you're going to marry or the type of people that you're dating, if you're trying to choose, like, what, what am I going to do in this marriage that isn't going well? And, and can I be real? Like, if, they're, if you're struggling with addictive habits or in that marriage relationship, you are using terms like, and we're going to be real, divorce. And I'm not telling you how to live your life, but I want to tell you this. If you're making pivotal, lifelong decisions and you're not hitting your knees in prayer every morning and every evening, do you really think you are prepared to make that decision? At least from a Christian biblical perspective, I want to encourage you that none of us are because the power and the authority to change this world happens only when Jesus is working in and through us and it takes us sitting at his feet. Number three, why many of us don't do that is because hearing from God can feel quiet at times. It can feel quiet at times. I want to end with uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. The prophet Elijah, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, maybe you've heard of him, he literally in uh, chapter 18 saw God rain down fire from the sky. Supernatural event, saves his life, everything. Amazing thing. The, the very next chapter, chapter 19, he has forgotten how God has shown up in the past and he runs away in fear for his life, hides under a bush and tells God, I just want to die. Despair and hopelessness can set in when we are not prioritizing communing with God in our life. We won't see the immeasurable more. All we'll see is all of these reasons why we could never change this world. But if we hit our knees every morning and hit our knees every night, our marriages become different. The way we parent our kids become different. If you're having a problem with a child and you're not hitting your knees in prayer, why do you think something is going to change from a Christian biblical perspective at least? So it's hit me, man, in our church right now, in this season, it is so important that we prioritize communing with him, connecting with him. You know what happens right after Elijah is hiding under a bush in despair? God shows up. Verse 9, he, he went into a cave and spent the night. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. He gives all the reasons that he couldn't change. Despair has sent in. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, and the Lord is about to pass by. You know what the Lord does? You know what happens next? Big wind happens. Mountain falls down. God wasn't in the wind earthquake occurs all around him god wasn't in the earthquake fire rains down god wasn't in the fire instead it was only a lot when elijah quieted in his life enough that he heard the still small voice of the lord speaking to him the truth is in our lives we don't like quietness in our culture we like busyness and distraction, and we fill our lives with everything. We can't have quiet. We gotta have the radio on, the TV blaring while we're texting five different people, taking pictures on Instagram while we're doing it. Because we like to be busy and distracted, and we don't like quietness. It, it makes us afraid. See, as I was thinking about what we're about to share in together and inviting God fully into our life, communing with him, when we spend time with him, when we sit at the feet of Jesus, it's like we get to allow his Holy Spirit to change us and empower us. Do we have any basketball fans out there? Now, I'm not going to debate who the greatest basketball player of all time is. Some of you might think it was Kobe Bryant, and you would be wrong. Some of you think uh, LeBron James is the greatest, and he's a really great player, and Steph Curry's good too. But Michael Jordan is the greatest player of all time. We all know that. And I always, because I'm a product of the 90s, I guess, and I always pictured, like, how cool would it be if I could, like, unzip my skin? I know this is weird. And, like, Michael Jordan could step in, and I could still be me, but now I'm Michael Jordan inside my body. And then I, I zip the skin back up, and I go out and play one basketball game. How, how cool would that be? Be able to dunk from the free throw line, all that kind of stuff. Every day, you have the ability to commune with God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. All he desires, he misses you. He longs for you. He wants you in his life. He says, guys, just do, stay awake, commune, connect with me, sit with me, hear from me, be with me. But I'm too busy doing for you, God. 
He says, come and sit with me. I just want you to be with me first. You get to zip in the Spirit of God to empower you to go change the world. I love that you're an ambitious human being, but first know the Spirit of God that lives inside of you by communing with me. And if you forget everything else in our time together, that would be my desire for you. Whatever decisions you're facing, no matter how pivotal they are, and for us as a church in this season of uh, unleashing the lion and taking these huge next steps, that we would prioritize hitting our knees in the morning, hitting our knees at night, praying about the things that matter, and inviting God fully in because he is the one that will empower us to change it. But the truth is some of us haven't realized the love of our Father and how desperately he misses us. And we have been running away, getting distracted and busy with so many things in this world. And I got to pray with the high school student that gave his life to Christ and pro professes faith publicly right in that prayer room last night and he just out loud said I confess you as Lord I want you in my life and now we're going to baptize him in a few weeks and there are some of you sleeping giants of the faith in the room you may have just come home for college from the weekend or maybe you've been here a long time or you're attending online and God wants to speak to you and tell you he created you he redeemed you why should you sit at the feet of Jesus because he loves you he redeemed you he saved you he wants to be not only your friend but your mentor and your guiding light in this dark world to make a difference and if we allowed him and we communed with him we could experience all of that